Um, this is going to be sectionalism. Part two. This time it's personal, I guess. I don't know. But anyway, it is part two. Lots of things, lots of events coming at you fast. I suggest um, looking at the companion PowerPoint that I'll have to you. Um, looking at your notes for this because there's just a lot here that is going to set us down the road to a civil war, which we still aren't going to get to in this video. <laughs> Deal with it. Um, but anyway, this is sectionalism part two. We're going to start with something called the Compromise of 1850. So I talked about that Mexican session, the Mexican session that we got in the last video, um, that big chunk of what is now called the American Southwest that we gained from the Mexican-American War. Well, there's going to be a few different things that become big issues here. And the first thing that sparks this crisis is California wants to become a state in 1850. Now, that's super quick by becoming state terms, but... There was something in 1848 called the California Gold Rush, and people from all over the world, but especially the eastern United States, but also all over the world, rushed to California. And the po population grew so fast that by 1850, oh my gosh, by 1850, they were already ready to become a state. Um, and so basically, California applies as a free state. Lots and lots of those people, those prospectors, don't want to have to compete with slave labor to mine gold. And so that's how you end up with California wanting to be a free state. That would throw off the balance of power in the Senate, the same sort of thing that we've been worried about the whole time. So southern states really don't like that. So we takes a compromise. Henry Clay, known in history as the great compromiser, and I haven't talked about him enough here, which stinks. He's one of my favorite historical figures. Uh, interesting guy. But he is old. And he's like, his best days are far behind him. He's going to die within a few years, and this is like his last compromise. Um, and it's not great, but, you know, it, it got the job done for a little while, I guess. So California is going to become a state. That's part one. There's four parts to this. So part one, California becomes a state. Part two, New Mexico and Utah territories get popular sovereignty. That's the concept, like I said last time. They're going to vote on whether they want slavery or not, whether they want to be a slave state or a free state. Part three, the slave trade ends in Washington, D.C. Kind of crazy to think that in the capital of what was supposed to be the freest part of the world at the time, you could still trade slaves up until this time. So this doesn't ban ownership. If you're a politician coming from the South, you can still bring your slaves with you, but you can't trade them in D.C. And then the last part I'll talk a lot more about is a tougher Fugitive Slave Act. So part four, Fugitive Slave Act. These had existed in the past, but they hadn't been so, um, let's say, aggressive as this one. So slaves escape to the north. Happens semi-common or semi-often. And when you have this Underground Railroad, which is designed to help this happen, it's happening. So with the Fugitive Slave Act, it made it so that basically Southerners had much more power to go north and bring people back. It made it so that northern sheriffs, regardless of what they kind of believed, were supposed to help the southern slave catchers catch runaway slaves. And, and if they did not help or didn't seem to help enough, or they could be fined, they could be thrown in jail. So a lot of northerners hate this because it's a way of expanding slavery kind of into the north in a weird way. Not that you're going to have plantations in the north, but um, southerners are coming up all the time looking for runaway slaves. And there's plenty of free African-American communities in the north. And this is before you have like social security card and like paperwork to really prove who you are. Like you might have a birth certificate in some places. So it's hard to like go and just say, well, he's a runaway slave. And the person's like, I'm not. And you can just kind of fly your way through it. Um, another big blow between the states, another big issue is something called the Dred Scott case. And this is a Supreme Court case. Dred Scott is an enslaved man. He's owned by an army officer. You move all throughout the country when, you're army off when you are an army officer. And he took Dred Scott with him and didn't tell him, like, hey, you're in free territory now because he doesn't have to tell him that, I guess, and he never did. So he took him through Illinois up to, like, Minnesota territory, I believe it was, which was meant as a free territory. There are not supposed to be slaves here. Dred Scott lived there, ended up back in Missouri after several years there, didn't know, was never informed. And then, basically... Uh, with the help of abolitionists, was able to sue this uh, man and saying he should be free. He actually sued a different man. That army officer died. It's a whole thing. But anyway, long story short, the decision, which was so destructive, it said that you could take a slave into a free state and that person was still a slave. 
it said that African Americans really had no right to bring court cases against white folks either, which is pretty bad. Um, and so the Dred Scott case, to, if you're a Northerner, is like, uh, what? Like, we voted to have no slavery. We voted to be free states for a reason. And you're kind of really undoing that. So it's going to cause a lot of issues. And it's going to make a lot of people very angry. Especially you combine it. This is after Uncle Tom's Cabin has been published. And people see a lot of the realities of slavery. And they're like, this is insane what our country is doing. So next we get the Kansas-Nebraska Act. A little voice crack there for you. The Kansas-Nebraska Act brings the principle of popular sovereignty to Kansas and Nebraska. Now, under the Missouri Compromise, Kansas and Nebraska were supposed to be free states, but this undoes that. This just undoes it. They're like, we're not doing that. We're going to do popular sovereignty there. And this, if you could point to a point where the Civil War maybe becomes inevitable, this is kind of where it happens. Because here's what happens. Best of intentions, just always going awry. Um, they're going to have an election. Kansas is a territory. Kansas fills up for Nebraska. And they are going to vote on whether it will be a free or slave state in their constitution. So basically, what ends up happening is something called bleeding Kansas. Kansas is bordered by Missouri, a slave state. And Iowa, a free state, but also people from like Illinois. And so um, basically, what ends up happening is all these folks from either side move into Kansas and commit like mass voter fraud. And a lot of times they'll bring guns and start militias. And there is something called bleeding Kansas. This starts happening in like 1854. So a long time before the Civil War. And the most extreme people from both sides are going to Kansas armed. And they are committing voter fraud and they are fighting. There is a miniature war inside of Kansas for years before the Civil War ever starts. It's called Bleeding Kansas. And it's not like, you know, big battles and things like that. It's more like, I'm going to get me and my friends who are anti-slavery or pro-slavery, whatever it is, and we're going to go murder that family that we know is the other side. And it just goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Terrible situation. And really just was caused by this popular sovereignty thing. Um, one of the people who becomes famous from this is a guy named John Brown. John Brown is very interesting because he is probably a crazy person. He heard a lot of voices, um, but he was an abolitionist, and he believed very strongly in that. He carried like an old-school medieval sword with him, and he would, when he was in Bleeding Kansas, he would kill pro-slavery people with it. So it's pretty extreme stuff, um, <laughs> very violent, and he didn't have it all together all the time. But anyway, he devises a plan. He's going to start a massive slave rebellion. And so he goes to a place in Virginia with some of his followers called Harper's Ferry, which is a federal arsenal. An arsenal is where you keep all the military's weapons when they aren't using them. And so they break into the arsenal, which was a lot easier than I guess than it is now. I don't know. And their plan was they would break into this arsenal and they would have all the slaves in the area flock to them and they would be able to arm them and then they would just march through and destroy plantations and gather more slaves until the South was liberated. But they never told any of the slaves. Not that they would have had a way to really tell them. So instead they raided this arsenal and the militia comes, the Virginia militia shows up and starts, you know, fighting them. There's like a firefight and they all end up dead or captured. Um, John Brown, several of his sons die. He's captured. He has some really infamous... Uh, last words. One second. Now I'm like over here and I didn't even look him up. I just am thinking of him as I film the video. Very unprofessional. Very bad video, Mr. Gone. Terrible. Um, but he basically says that... Well, maybe it's not that one. But anyway, he says that in one of his speeches that there's no way that this will ever be settled other than by all his blood. He basically is able to kind of prophesy... The Civil War coming in a way. But then he gets executed. Um, so basically, after that, that is like a lot of Southerners then are like, man, these abolitionists are absolutely insane. They're literally ready to raid the South. Um, so in the 1850s, people are growing more and more fearful about sectionalism. The idea of secession, that we should be able to leave the Union, is growing in popularity in a lot of places in the South. Um, and South Carolina is always going to cause trouble. There's a little spoiler alert for next week or for next time I make a video. And uh, don't worry, I'll have a wardrobe change. I've had this wardrobe for a while. But they uh, 
pretty much start talking about the idea of leaving the immune as a very real thing. So, yeah, that's sectionalism part deux. And I uh, hope you have a good day.